Well, let's talk about geology now, the study of rocks, and we'll include fossils in this as well. The first misimpression that I have to uh, clear up here, because people think, well, haven't rocks been radiometrically proven to be billions of years old, right? And uh, people have misconceptions about that. They, they just think it's almost like magic. You know, you just have, you take up your rock, you hold your tricorder out, you scan it, and oh, oh, there it is, millions of years old, right? Well, really, it's, it's more complicated than that. I'm going to kind of sum it up here for you briefly. It's, and it's, again, more complicated than this. But basically, there are certain kinds of atoms in nature that are unstable. We call them, they're, they're said to be radioactive. And what that means is they will spontaneously change into another type of atom. You don't have to, there's no external force necessary. Uranium-238, for example, will spontaneously change into the next atom, which changes into the next one, and so on, all the way down to lead-206. Lead-206 is not radioactive. It's stable. And so once you're lead-206, forever you are lead-206, unless there's some kind of outside force. But uh, only, fortunately, only a small fraction of atoms are of the radioactive variety, so you don't have to worry about changing into something else within the next 24 hours anyway. Um, now, the idea is this, this process, at least for some atoms like uranium, is very, very slow. Uh, you know, atom by atom, one popping into the next and so on. And so the idea is if you, had a, if you had a chunk of solid uranium and you waited long enough, it would be part uranium and part lead with some of the intermediate elements as well. And eventually it would be all lead. That's the idea. And so you, you can use that like a clock because the rate is known. And it's thought not to be affected by temperature, at least not very much, or by chemistry and so on. And so it, it seems like it's a really good clock. And so if you pick up a rock on Earth and it's got some uranium and some lead in it, you could extrapolate backwards and figure out when the rock was all uranium. Or, but how do you know it was all uranium to begin with? Maybe the rock had some lead in it to begin with when it was first created, right? So you'd have to know what it started with, right? Well, how do I know what it started with? Well, you tell me how old you want the rock to be and I'll tell you what it started with, you see? <laughs> And by the way, evolutionists do not assume that it started with all uranium. They assume that it had some lead in it to begin with. Uh, in a way, it's the same way that um, you can keep time with an hourglass. Now, I think you can keep time with an hourglass if, if certain assumptions are met. I mean, if you came in here and I had an hourglass you know, starting when you first came in here and, it's, and it looked like that, it looked like it does on the screen with about ha you know, halfway through, and I say, how long ago did I turn that over? Well, that's easy. It's an hourglass, halfway done, half an hour, right? I say, oh, I got you, because in fact it was sideways when I first came in. Al already a lot of the sand was in the bottom chamber. You see, you assume that all the sand started in the top chamber, which would be like assuming the rock was all uranium to begin with, and that wasn't the case. Or how do you know that somebody didn't come and add sand to the uh, hourglass when you weren't looking, right? That would affect your age estimate. And in fact, in rocks, certain chemicals like uranium are leachable in salt water. They can, they can actually move in and out of the rock. It's possible for that to happen. Or how do you know the throat of the bottle has always been the same size? And if the throat was wide, it's probably realistic for an hourglass. But we think that the rate at which uh, radioactivity occurs can change. We know it can change under certain circumstances because we can do it. Certain kinds of radioactivity have been accelerated by a factor of a billion in laboratories. And so if it can happen in laboratories, it can probably happen outside of laboratories too. So basically, these are some of the assumptions involved in radiometric dating. <clears throat> that the initial conditions are known, that the decay rate is constant, we have very good evidence that number two is wrong. And for that reason, um, the, eight, the estimated ages of these rocks are going to be very much inflated because they assume that the decay rate's been constant when in fact it hasn't. But regardless, regardless of these details, I want you to take home this bottom line. Here's the bottom line. We've tested rocks of known age, and they fail in, in terms of getting the right radiometric age estimate. Uh, Mount St. Helens, for example, when it erupted in 1980, and there were some subsequent eruptions, we took some brand new rocks that had formed from the magma, and that's supposed to set the zero point for the, for the radiometric uh, clocks. And we sent them in and had them radiometrically dated, which you normally wouldn't do, because it's expensive. Why would you test it on a rock of known age, right? Well, because we wanted to check the method. We wanted to see if the method works. And these brand new rocks came back with estimated ages of hundreds of thousands to millions of years on brand new rocks. And you say, well, that's an isolated incident. It's not. If you go to Hawaii and you take a rock from Hawaii and have it radiometrically dated, a brand new rock, you saw it come out of the volcano, you could stick your pike in it and let it, you know, let it cool right there and send it in, you will get millions of years, pretty consistently. So the bottom line is radiometric dating has been shown to not work on rocks of known age, and yet evolutionists assume it works on rocks of unknown age. Now, to me, that's a lot of blind faith right there. That's not a reasonable faith. We all have faith. That's not a reasonable faith. 
Because when you test it and it doesn't work in little things, how can you trust it in large things? That's kind of a biblical principle, isn't it? If I gave you a calculator and you put 2 plus 2 equals and it gave you 67,521. And I said, well, no, don't worry, it works on big numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think I trust that. I don't think I would trust it with big numbers. What about carbon dating? Now, carbon dating is a little better because we think the acceleration of the radioactive decay didn't affect carbon as much. But car people have heard of carbon dating and they think it gives billions of years. It doesn't, nor could it, because C14 decays very quickly. I'll, I'll come back to that. But um, carbon dating is one type of these, this radiometric dating. But with carbon dating, it tends to give the right answer. And when we, when we test it on things of known age, it tends to give reasonable answers. Now, it's not infallible either. But it tends to give answers that are um, consistent with what we'd expect when tested on things of known age. And the idea with um, carbon dating is there's a certain variety of carbon. Most carbon is C12. There's a certain variety of it that's C14. It's got two extra neutrons. And it's radioactive. C12 is stable. C14, radioactive. And a small fraction of that is in the atmosphere that we're breathing right now. It's in the food that you eat. It's incorporated into your body. So a small fraction of you is C14. So you're all slightly unstable. How about that? <laughs> you knew that, though, right? And while you're alive, I mean, that C14 is constantly decaying into nitrogen. But when you're alive, you're replacing it because you're eating new food, you're breathing air, and so on. You're exchanging carbon with your environment. And so you replenish it. But when you die, it simply decays away. And so the idea is, by measuring the C14 to C12 in something, you can tell how long ago it died. And we find that it tends to give the right answer. And the interesting thing is it gives the right answer that creationists would expect, even on things that evolutionists believe to be millions of years old, like coal beds. You can take a chunk of coal. It'll have C14 in it every time. You won't, you won't find an exception to that. And yet, if uh, C14, if the entire Earth were nothing but C14, after one million years, you would not have a single atom left. That's how quickly, how quickly it decays. And yet, they find it in coal beds that they think are hundreds of millions of years old. Can't be that old. The C14 would be gone. We've even found C14 in diamonds. <coughs> diamonds that evolutionists believe to be one to two billion years old based on these other radiometric um, methods. And yet, you, you, there's C14 in them. <laughs> they can't be that old. They can't be more than a few thousand years old. Isn't that interesting? And they say, well, there must be some kind of contamination. How? It's a diamond. It's the hardest substance. How are you going to get new C14 in there? It's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. We've even carbon dated uh, dinosaur fossils. You know, sometimes with fossils, if there's enough carbon left, you can actually carbon date them. And uh, every one that we've tested has C14 in it. They're all thousands of years old. Not one of them is dated millions of years old by carbon dating. Lots of things like that. You tend not to hear about these in the... Uh, secular school system, uh, sadly. But there are all kinds of physical processes that limit the age of the Earth to much less than the billions of years that most people are taught.